Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Katrina Kosick, Senior Research Fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI. Welcome to the IFPRI Policy Seminar on Research Findings on Resilience and Social Cohesion in Burkina Faso and Niger. Today's topic is particularly important as we see security in the Sahel rapidly deteriorating, and this is leading to forced displacement and various other challenges. Conflict over land and resources, driven by population growth, land degradation, and climate change, lies at the heart of this deterioration. The region's compromised security has significantly impacted livelihoods, food security, and health. To address these issues, the World Food Program and IFPRI have formed a partnership to enhance World Food Program's food assistance interventions using operational research. We've collaborated with key partners, including the Institute for Peace and Development, and have worked closely with World Food Program's Integrated Resilience Program in the Sahel. The work to be presented today was commissioned by the World Food Program in June 2021. Its purpose was to explore how integrated resilience interventions contribute to social cohesion and reduce tensions in Niger and Burkina Faso. This work holds particular significance for me as the lead of the new CGIAR research initiative on fragility, conflict, and migration, or FCM. FCM aims to address the challenges faced by vulnerable populations worldwide, and it focuses on livelihood, food, and climate security. We strive to build climate resilience and promote gender equality while fostering social inclusion. Thanks to generous funding from NORAD, FCM is embarking on a critical partnership to provide learning and decision support to the World Food Program. We're excited to be launching this work shortly and to collaborate with the food, World Food Program, not only for this event, but also in the future. If you would like to listen today to the presentations in French, please use the access link that we've provided in the chat box and click on the globe button located at the bottom of the screen to select French. Please also note that we are eager to hear from you during this event. So to participate in our Q&A session, please submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, um, uh, or Twitter by using the hashtag uh, AskIfpre. Now I would like to uh, introduce our speakers as a group, and I will subsequently be calling on, in, on each of them just by their name later. Thomas Conan is World Food Program Senior Regional Program and Policy Advisor and brings 18 years of experience in crisis response, recovery, and nexus programming. He has worked with operational and donor agencies, joining World Food Program's Regional Bureau in Dakar in 2021 to support World Food Program country offices in West Africa. Dr. Juanes Carujo is an agribusiness expert with more than 20 years of experience in value chain and market systems development. He's currently serving as head of resilience and food systems at World Food Program's Regional Bureau in Dakar. Ruth Mainzen Dick, a senior research fellow at IFPRI, specializes in the impact of institutions on natural resource management and the role of gender in development processes. With a PhD in development sociology, she has extensive research experience focusing on topics such as land and water policy, property rights, and collective action. Hippolyte Poole is executive director at the Institute of Peace and Development. Dr. Poole has extensive experience in the fields of agricultural economics and rural development. He specializes in topics including food security, climate change adaptation, and sustainable agriculture. Chaik Sam is a specialist in monitoring and evaluation as well as project management with extensive experience in the fields of community development and humanitarian assistance. As a research assessment and monitoring officer at World Food Program's Regional Bureau in Dakar, Chaik is currently supporting World Food Program country offices in Western Africa in developing monitoring and measurement systems for resilience programs. Finally, Nancy McCarthy is president of LEAD Analytics. She holds a PhD in agriculture and resource economics and a JD from the George Mason University School of Law. Her work focuses on natural resource management, governance, institutions, property rights, and land tenure systems, as well as responses to climate change. 
Thank you. And now I would like to call on Mr. Conan to offer some welcoming remarks. Hello, everyone, and um, greetings from Dakar, Senegal, and a very warm welcome also from my side. I'm, I'm very happy to see so many people connected, which is demonstrating a, a great interest in the linkage between food security, resilience, and social cohesion in the Sahel. When we kicked off the study that Katrina just mentioned with uh, ISPRI and IPD, we saw two competing trends. One was very worrying. Security in the Sahel was rapidly deteriorating. Violence increased, increased in intensity as well as in geographic patterns. This is a development that we're seeing, especially in the central Sahel, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, with serious repercussions on people's lives and livelihoods. Insecurity has become one of the main drivers of hunger in the region. The other development was rather positive. We were already a few years into a massive scale up of resilience building intervention with partners, with colleagues, with other agencies, which largely focus on land rehabilitation integrated with coal feeding, nutrition, and institutional capacity strengthening activities. And we could start to demonstrate the positive outcome of this investment on food security, on ecosystem restoration, on community resilience in Newshop. So none of our activities had the primary objective of strengthening social cohesion. And yet, colleagues in the field, discussing with local communities, with authorities, started to hear more and more anecdotes about how these activities were contributing, in fact, to social cohesion within and between com participating communities. So with this study, we set out to start building the evidence based on how resilience building programs contribute to social cohesion based on the primary data collection, as opposed to anecdotes or theoretical consideration. So as you can hear, we are very excited to share the findings of this study with you today, to hear your feedback and discuss together the way forward. We want these findings to inform further programming for WFP and beyond, obviously. We want to reinforce, enhance, intensify our efforts, as well as our collaboration with partners, working towards a clear objective to even more strongly leverage our operation to contribute to social cohesion and improve the prospects for peace. We want to keep reinforcing our evidence generation to more systematically monitor and measure social cohesion outcomes in partnership with IFPRI and others and with all of you today, if you want to join us in this exercise. Thanks again for joining us today and looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you so much uh, to Thomas Conan for his opening remarks. Uh, I'd now like to call on our next speaker. Um, we will have Juanes Carujo from the World Food Program um, talking to us about an introduction to World Food Program's integrated resilience approach. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll take a few moments to take you through our approach to integrated resilience uh, programming here in the Sahel. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, I'll show you exactly the rationale of investing in this resilience uh, in the Sahel. Well, as you know, uh, or as you may know, WFP is the largest humanitarian organization in the world, responding to emergencies all over the world, but the situation in the Sahel made us rethink our approach. You see, the Sahel is facing multiple crises that are happening at the same time. Just because of its uh, uh, geographical location, issues related to economic performance of the countries in the Sahel, environmental degradation, but also some social issues, including armed conflicts. All these issues cannot be solved by any single interventions. That's the reason why today we are talking about integrated resilience program. Our entry point has always been the rehabilitation of ecosystems. You see, degraded land uh, prevents people to really strengthen their livelihoods. 
But that's not all. It affects also all the people living in those communities, including households, uh, girls, children, school age children, and other people who are really depending on that land to make a living. That's the reason why, in addition to e ecosystem rehabilitation, WFP also invested in school based programs, nutrition, cash based transfers. We even went ahead and focused on local procurement so that smallholder farmers can have access to the markets. We continue to strengthen uh, smallholder agricultural systems and the strengthen capacity of institutions to achieve their mandate, uh, mostly making sure that the social fabric is held together and uh, communities have improved access to food. If we can go to the next slides, then I show you exactly how it looks like in practice. You see, it's very important to uh, anticipate and know what may happen in a few days. So being able to be the capacity to anticipate shocks and, uh, and the stressors that are likely to have an impact on the livelihood of communities is very important. Intervention related to information on weather forecast, early warning systems is very, very important. So farmers can make an informed decision of what to plant, what to plant, which variety uh, to use, if it's early maturing variety, or other activities knowing what may happen because of the information they hold so that anticipatory and absorptive capacity is very very important and we focus on that as well beyond that we help communities to adapt to ongoing situation by making sure that children have access to school meals making sure that uh, families have access to water they can use for community gardening that can provide them with additional food to use in their homestead. We also focus on transforming the way food is used and consumed by strengthening local and national capacities and institutional setups so that the entire community can have access to natural resources and use it in a very um, um in a very uh, sustainable way to ensure that the generation coming after this present generation also uh, doesn't fall into the same trap of poverty and hunger the next slide um shows the interdependence between all these interventions let's go to the next slide as you can see uh having a land that is productive is key. So what we do is to introduce water harvesting technologies, including the uh, use of groundwater to create a uh, that is productive and farmers can go ahead and produce. But these crops are also used to uh, ensure that schools are, have access to uh, nutritious and safe meals for children. At the same time, what goes on, children also pay attention. Children learn how to take care of the environment. Next slide. In terms of numbers, where we start, when we started this work in 2019, we managed to work with 1.3 million beneficiaries or uh, you know who were involved in our programs and we rehabilitated 35,000 hectares of degraded land our vision is that by 2028 we will be able to bring in the program 5 million beneficiaries and be able to rehabilitate close to uh, half half a million uh, degraded uh, hectares of degraded land we call upon you to join us and focus on strengthening the resilience of communities in the Sahel, because responding to emergencies all the time uh, will not be enough 
to lead a dignified life in the Sahel. It's very important to equip our people in the Sahel with the knowledge and access to productive assets so they can work on their own rather than waiting for humanitarian assistance. Next slide. As I said, we cannot do this, uh, do this alone. We need communities, we need people to participate. As a matter of fact, the participatory planning is part of what we do, and it has its own results because the sense of taking your, dig your uh, destiny in your hands and the plan for what can be done in your community. But also we need government and regional institutions to partner with us. So far, we have been working with other uh, UN agencies and G5 Sahel Executive Secretariat, but also our partnership with the Great Green War Initiative is paying, is the yielding result. We would like to continue our work on the ground with more than eight, 80 cooperating partners that are helping us implement the program. We are also partnering with universities to ensure that research is included in what we do. Being able to provide evidence of what, of what works well so that other partners, investors can look at land rehabilitation as an investment that will pay off in the future. With that, let me stop here and help uh, enable you to continue uh, following this conversation we will come back and see if you have any questions. Back to you, moderator. Thank you so much for those remarks um, from uh, Wones um, Karuho. I am now would like to call on our next speaker, Ruth Mines and Dick, for a presentation on social cohesion, land tenure, and women's empowerment. Thank you. So when WFP came to us, uh, to look at these issues of social cohesion it was relate we hadn't actually worked on how to measure social cohesion there aren't very good measures out there to date but it was related to a lot of other work we have done um, and in particular issues of land tenure and women's empowerment are relevant on the next slide i see look at how land tenure relates to social cohesion now first of all we need to take what do we mean by land tenure it's the relationship among people with respect to land and other related resources especially water um, and trees land tenure systems there's a lot of different ways to define them but they basically say who can use what resources for who how long under what conditions, what are their rights and responsibilities. Now, an important thing about land tenure is that these are, especially in the communal land holding systems that we find in much of Africa and especially in the Sahel, land tenure are ties that bind people together who share land, but they are also often the point of conflict with competing users and especially newcomers. Katrina alluded to this in her introductory remarks. So that's, I mean, we hear so much about how land is a point of conflict, but also land rights are important. Land tenure is important for a lot of the WFP uh, interventions that we've just heard about. For example, these demi loons that are uh, for land restoration or the tree planting. These are long term investments. So you have to negotiate whose land is going to be used, who benefits, who bears the costs. And all of this, plus the, the issues of the um, displaced persons who are coming into the areas, these are reasons why land tenure is so important. On the next slide, we see also why uh, gender is really important in social cohesion. Now we have to remember, gender are the characteristics of women and men, boys and girls, 
And these are socially constructed, not necessarily, not biological. That includes the norms, behaviors, roles that are associated with being a woman, man, girl, or boy, and the relationships with each other. Now, conflict is often very gendered, um, where women and men experience conflict uh, in different ways. They are, are hurt by conflict in different ways. Um, peace build on the flip side, peace building and building social cohesion can create new spaces for women to engage. And we've seen this, for example, in Liberia and Rwanda, where, where uh, often these public spaces that women have not engaged in, they start to in the post-conflict. So women's empowerment can both contribute to social cohesion activities and can benefit from them. But to make that happen takes conscious effort. Gender issues can't be just an afterthought. You have to think about how gender is addressed in all the activities uh, that we've just heard about, from the planning to the implementation. Um, that includes very often there's this notion that, oh, the land um, investments and the productivity are men's domains and the uh, school feeding and the, the nutrition related activities are women's domain. But actually looking at gender across all of those is really important to make it work and create these positive uh, synergies rather than reinforcing the negative cycles that we often see in conflict situations and some post-conflict situations. Now, what we're going to hear, I don't want to jump ahead uh, from the next session on the findings, but I just want you to have these things in mind as you hear about the results. Uh, and over to uh, Katrina to introduce or for our next speaker. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you to Ruth Mines and Dick for her remarks. Uh, next, we have Hippolyte Pohl presenting on findings on resilience and social cohesion in Burkina Faso and Niger. Hippolyte, you are muted. Um, if you would unmute and uh, commence again. Thank you. We are still not hearing anything on your side, Hippolyte. All right, I think we're having some technical challenges here. Um, all right, Hippolyte, I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, if um, doing something with your equipment will help. Um, there we are. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Thank you so much. If you'd be so kind as to start over. Um, Thank you, I'm Dr. sorry. I'm sorry about that hiccup. I was going to thank all the previous speakers for making my life easier by giving the contextual background to the studies that was conducted in Burkina Faso and Niger. Next slide. You will understand from the presentation that was done already, the complexity of factors that undermine vulnerabilities in the two, country, in the two countries you know, hinged around human-made and natural disasters that reduce capacities for food security and uh, uh, other vulnerabilities. Next slide. WAP's interventions in the area focused on several communities. In uh, the research that we conducted largely focused on 14 uh, areas in each of the regions. And you can see on the map, basically where the data was collected. Next slide. 
Now, the interventions that uh, we're looking at, basically in addition to reducing uh, uh, food insecurity, looked at how to minimize tensions between communities in respect for competition for natural resources. And so the WFP was looking at how do you increase access to natural resources, make it equitable, and facilitate inter-community dialogue. But as uh, Thomas said at the beginning, uh, WFP did not set out to promote social cohesion and therefore had no objectives, no activities, no hypotheses, no theories of change to, to influence social cohesion in the intervention areas. Next slide. But the interventions basically focus on two grand areas, all channeled through promoting collaborative uh, uh, work action in communities and building capacities, asset recovery and conflict sensitivity programming, all directed to using to promoting land rehabilitation, access to water resources, soil fertility improvement in the hope of reducing vulnerabilities to communities and also in reducing intercommunal conflicts related to resource competition. Next slide. WFP's uh, interventions were carried through four main intervention areas, cash support to the communities that were working together, food assistance as well to the communities through direct food distribution, capacity building in form of training, especially in the areas of conflict management and technology transfer, which is what other speakers have talk, uh, spoken about eloquently, you know, through the co uh, combination of land recovery, natural resource rehabilitation, and so forth and so on. That technology was transferred. So those, those four axes provided the basis for the BFP's interventions in the area. Next slide. Now, as uh, Thomas said at the beginning, WFP did not set out to do social cohesion building, but they were hearing stories, they were hearing anecdotal evidence that, well, what you are doing is actually helping us to be uh, more united and cohesive more than uh, before. And so the question was, to what extent is WFP's work contributing to social cohesion building? And as I said, since they did not set out to do anything on that front, they had no theories, they had no uh, uh, basis for measuring that. Next slide. So the research was commissioned basically to find out how does WFP's interventions contribute to reducing tensions and improving social cohesion. That's the purpose of the research. Next slide. Because there was no uh, background to social cohesion building in the context of uh, the activities, uh, we set out with a grounded research approach, basically trying to understand what is going on. And so we didn't go in there with preconceived hypotheses or indicators or any defined data codes to measure. We used um, uh, in open inquiry approaches, you know, participation, focus group discussions, and key informant interviews at multiple levels, you know, to try to find out from the participants, from those working on these issues, what have they seen, why do they think it's happening, where is it happening, how the change might happen in those ways. We also did a mini survey to give us an extent a perspective on the extent to which some of the factors that may influence social cohesion were actually in play at this point. Next slide. So the findings, basically go to the next slide. The findings told us that if the participants said, yes, WFP's activities are helping us to address the issues of vulnerabilities that were there, the natural and human-made vulnerabilities drought, floods, bushfires, land conflicts, uh, and then to some extent, the activities of violent extremists in those areas. That the belief is, uh, they were, these were issues confronted them, and they were able to address that through the activities of the WFP. Next slide, please. So what was then happened was that in terms of the direct resource rehabilitation and so forth, land and asset recovery improvement progress were, were very beneficial. They saw that coming through the agroforestry initiatives, through land recovery initiatives, the demi dunes and the zais that we're constructing. They saw a massive improvement for the soil fertility uh, initiatives 
based on the composting that they learned and the fertilizer that WFE provided and other forms of uh, soil water retention technologies that they learned. Livestock production, remember this area has both uh, herders and farmers. Livestock production saw a boost as well because there was an increased amount of uh, livestock feed and also say diversific diversification of livestock feed. So people didn't have to go too far away to feed their animals. And that created another level of uh, engagement that we'll talk about later on. Water access was improved through the digging of wells, dams, uh, dugouts, uh, and so forth. Next slide. But at the level of social cohesion, the participants said, look, in addition to having all this natural access improved for us, we saw social cohesion happening at multiple levels. First, at the horizontal level, within communities, between individuals, between groups within the communities, and between communities as well, different communities working together, so that they had uh, facilitated dialogue sessions, a consensus building that was coming up, they were able to create opportunities for uh, engaging communal labor and so forth. And there was the integration of IDPs, more importantly, where IDPs and refugees existed, they had opportunity through this work together to integrate into the communities. Next slide. Now, we asked people in the survey, you know, what elements contributed to social cohesion building amongst them? And you can see the results on the slide. Of all the factors, religion at the very top and in the middle, there didn't seem to be a factor that was promoting social cohesion or working against social cohesion. And we'll explain that later. Next slide. We also asked people about trust building as a result of their participation in WFP's activities. And you can see that uh, more than 70% of participants consistently said, you know, by participating in WFP's activities, there was increased trust between the different groups, different ethnic, religious, uh, uh, socioeconomic groups. There was more respect between the different groups and that suspicions between them have reduced significantly. Next slide. Feeling safe in an environment is a factor that determines how one will relate to the other. So social cohesion in the context of safety, security is an important factor. So we asked participants to what extent they felt safe and more secured by participating in these activities in respect to their neighbors. And again, you can see the results consistently. More than 90% of them said you know, we feel safe engaging with other ethnic groups. We no longer fear to be part of any activities, you know, go to their funerals, their weddings, and so forth. You know, we feel secured and protected even when they are leaving. They can leave their houses, their children, in the care of their neighbors, you know, and they don't feel discriminated against any longer because now they know each other through working together and so forth. Next slide. We, found, we tried to find out also whether collaborative working among them, themselves, especially in areas of conflict resolution, was taking place. And you can see the results in Burkina Faso and both Niger. They said yes, working together on common up projects has enabled them to work, uh, to be more uh, engaging and uh, engaged in a collaborative conflict management among themselves. Next slide. One of the factors we looked at was also horizontal. So we looked at horizontal social cohesion. Now we're looking at vertical, the relationship between people of different social, uh, levels of society. And in this case, we're looking at gender-based uh, and age-based dynamics. You know, and you will see from this slide that women were able to interact with men, which wasn't usually the case because of the patriarchal, hierarchical societies that they lived in. But in, this, in the context of this uh, project. Women were able to relate more with men, boys or young men with the elders, and the elders with the young men. It created a space for a co-mingling of different uh, people of different age groups, before different gender groups, because they had to work together. And that created uh, a vertical social, social cohesion. Another aspect was that uh, because they had to work together with the local community, local government authorities, whether at the local level, provincial level, in the planning processes, it also opened doors for community level members to engage with people that 
they would never have uh, had the chance to engage with before. And so that was another level of uh, vertical social cohesion that this project activities created. Next slide. These are uh, testimonies that people shared, just a few. If you read a full report, you have a lot more, you know. And the first text was that before the arrival of the BFP, we did not meet at the Chiefs Palace if it was not for traditional festivals. But now they can go there at any time and point in time and engage with the chief. That is an example of what the BFP project has done. The next one says that members of our community and those of others got to know each other better. We put aside our differences and then they were able to work together because they work together on uh, the same projects, identifying interests and working on them on the same projects. This created opportunity for them to, to get to know each other more. Next slide. Now, how did change happen? So the key question is, what are the lessons we learned from this? Next slide. Change happened in two ways. WAP's contributions were either catalytic or triggers. Catalytic in the sense that in all societies, especially in very poor rural communities, there's always a lot of empathy, a lot of sympathy. People try to help each other as when they can. But what happened in the case is that, in this case, that because of their peace activities created spaces and brought resources and created processes for them to work together, it stimulated the resource, uh, the, the actions that uh, people were uh, engaged in and moved it to a level higher than what they would actually have done before. You know, community, community mobilization was very, very effective. Uh, it helped them to see that they were interdependent they shared common interests, they shared common resources, and that they can, if they work together, they'll be able to resolve many of their problems. The triggers were that the collective action created social bonding, you know, so that people who never were, uh, acted uh, together before had now had an opportunity to meet, discuss, engage, identify common interests, and actually work together. You know, and through that, the stereotypes that they had before, the suspicions that they had before were all broken, and they were able now to open up to each other, attend each other's fe uh, festivals, intermarriages were increasing, and there was also social bridging, you know, between different levels of communities to make sure that uh, they, they maintain those relationships. Next slide. So in, in looking at the results, we're very careful, to, uh, mindful of the intrinsic versus the extrinsic values of the research. In other words, um, do these things happen because the WFP is continuing to pump in resources? Will they continue after the WFP has pumped in resources? You know, that, in other words, sustainability questions come into play. You know, so we looked at that and uh, they, it was evident that, yes, community members appreciated what WFP was doing, but they wanted WFP to go take it one step further. As they said, you know, you taught us, uh, you give us the fish, but teach us how to fish. How do you create interventions that allow community members to continue to do this uh, without the BFP support. The place of religion, you know, religion wasn't a major factor in determining social cohesion in both Burkina Faso and Niger, principally because in both countries, uh, Islam is a dominant religion. And so participants were really worried about intra-religious conflicts more than inter-religious conflicts. But unfortunately, we did not investigate intra-religious conflicts in this study. That would be an area to investigate uh, moving forward. Women's uh, role, we highlighted the role that women were beginning to play in society, they'll be getting more respected because they earn income, they have voices in society. But the issue of land ownership remained a question. It was divided actually, because in some in cases they say, yes, women have access to land, they have equal access to land as in Burkina Faso. In Niger, it wasn't that so clear. Because they said, no, the land belongs to the men, the women can farm on it, but they don't own it. There was a clear distinction between land ownership and uh, the right to use land. And those uh, dimensions need to be further investigated. Next slide. There were several limitations to this study. The scope was limited, as uh, Ruth mentioned earlier, because we saw this as a pilot, you know. Uh, because of security concerns, we couldn't go to all the communities that the WFP was working in. And so there were outlier communities that couldn't be touched. And their realities may have been different from those that we were able to access. So that's an area that needs to be uh, assessed as well. 
The, these studies took place, the data collection took place between February and March. This is a time the transhumans people, it's a dry season, transhumans people may have moved on. And so the, and the grains bands are fairly full at that time. You know, so you will expect that if people are responding to the questions based on their current experiences, you know, um, that needs to be factored in, into the interpretation of the results. Would they have done the same thing if the research was con uh, conducted during the period of uh, shortages, like this time of the year? Probably we don't know, you know. Um, scope was limited, and the number of people we interviewed was limited. Uh, the results were not unexpected, but were unique to WFP, you know. Next slide. There were suggestions from participants because we asked them, if you have recommendations for WFP uh, uh, to continue on this project, what would you, your suggestions be? They had reactions. We also have the findings from that. Next slide. Next slide. You will find out that uh, respondents want to see an expansion, enhancement, and intensification of the activities. They want to see opportunities expanded to off-farm uh, production, income generating activities. They want to see the WSP in so support, intensified peace education. They want to see investment in development of complementary infrastructure, roads, bridges, uh, uh, and so forth, you know. And they want to see a focus on agribusiness capacity development so that they are not just producing to feed themselves, they can also produce for the market so they can earn incomes from their productive activities. These are areas that they want to see greater investments from the WFP. Next slide. From our perspective, based on the findings that we saw, there's, there are four, five strands of uh, interventions that we see coming up. Continue, consolidate, and spread the good activities that are already ongoing, but there are some that need to be reviewed and reoriented. For instance, the, the issue about um, uh, women's role in the, in, the, in the farming system that we have, how do women actually get access to land and own it in all communities? That is very critical. So those ones need to be looked at again and see how do you orient it. One area was the, 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 the distribution of uh, money to support the activities. There were a lot of calls for a revisit to that approach so that they can make it uh, less uh, burdensome uh, more readily available. And sometimes there are recommendations about increasing the quantum the, the, the need. Recognize, validate, and harness local capacities for leadership, especially the local capacities of chiefs and traditional leaders that existed. How do you use that as a, the rallying point to build more sustainable uh, uh, work groups? You know, so having community management, uh, community uh, management teams was important. But would that last beyond WFP? Whereas the traditional leaders have always been there, will continue to be there. Could we have invested more in building capacities there to sustain their, their role in society? Leverage and innovate and deepen. So there are certain things that were, were done that were done right, but you needed to be able to deepen those ones. For instance, in the, the uh, provision of water, there was a, a call for more dams you know, bigger dams, you know, and a solar pump facilities, you know, is that what can do? Of course, this WFP cannot do all these things, but can WFP partner with other partners to, to help them uh, motivate this one and take them on, you know. Federal research and learning is required in several areas. We've mentioned already the issue of uh, land in relation to the women, you know, the role of religion in the conflict uh, systems in, in the Sahel and so forth. Thank you. I think the last slide is the question. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much to Hippolyte Pohl uh, for his very interesting presentation. Um, a really fascinating study and that those recommendations are, are, are very helpful for programming going forward. I'd like to invite 
all of the panelists to turn on their cameras um, following their presentations. We are entering now our Q&A session. Um, so we will have, I've, uh, we've got some questions already, more will be coming in online. Um, and so again, please to those in our audience, um, please participate in our Q&A session, submit your questions on ifpre.org, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitter by using the hashtag, hashtag askifpre, um, and we can consider your questions during this event. Um, but thank you so much for that, those series of really fascinating presentations. Um, I would like to start with a question for Juanes Carujo. Um, you know, conflict can really seldom be reduced to a single cause, and the Sahel is clearly no exception. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us why it is that you chose to focus on the availability and management of land and water resources for this particular um, study. Well, thank, thanks for the question. You know, folks uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, they are familiar with the phrase, it's the economy stupid, but I'm not going to repeat what uh, James Carver said, but I can really say that equitable access to natural resources is very important in terms of even reducing conflicts between communities. So whether you are uh, supporting um, farmers with crop production, you've got to make sure that there is also further production for animals. Whether you're working on agricultural uh, water, you've got to make sure that there is also water points that herders can use to uh, provide water to their animals. So all that really uh, strengthens the resilience of those communities, not only um, reducing conflict, but also boosting their livelihood. So, uh, it was very important and strategically uh, relevant to focus on land rehabilitation and the water management. Back to you. Um, great, thank you um, very much for that. Uh, those remarks. Um, my next question is for Hippolyte Pohl. I'm wondering what makes World Food Program's food assistance for asset activities different from similar interventions by other agencies in contributing to social cohesion? Thank you for that question, a great question. Several factors. One, WAP's activities focus on promoting collectively identified needs. So it's not the, uh, the question of just somebody jumping out from a land cruiser and saying, this is what you need, but it's the community people who went through a process of identifying that collectively uh, real needs. You know, Then there was a process of dialogue that allowed them to make decisions about what should we be focusing on, or how should we be addressing these ones. And then also, because of that dialogue process, there was a breakdown in the gender and age gap. I think we have lost you. Um... I'm not sure if some troubleshooting would work on your end, uh, Hippolyte. We are not hearing you right now and not seeing your visual either. All right, um, Hippolyte, since we haven't heard from you, I will welcome you to please um, pause your remarks and please plan to come in again once your technological issues are are sorted. Um, if I could move on to a question for Ruth Mines and Dick, please. Um, Ruth, I wonder if you could tell us what were there any major surprises or results related to the property rights in the study? Really interested in this aspect of it. Thanks. Yeah, good question. We hear so much about land as the source of conflict. What really struck me were two aspects of this. One was that people in the communities said they wanted to host outsiders and the WFP providing additional resources that sort of enriched the value of the land and provided uh, food, other sources of food security made it easier for people to do what they they said they wanted to in terms of hosting others. The other thing is, and uh, Nancy McCarthy, who will be coming in later and who was part of this study, has, has done a lot of study about the 
the interaction between transhuman pastoralists and agricultural communities in the Sahel. There has historically been a complementarity between the two groups, as well as points of tension throughout, probably throughout history, but for a long time. One of the things that this program and Tenure, land tenure for pastoralists is different. It's not an exclusive right, but it's, it's rights of access and use that are negotiated. One of the things that this did was by stressing the, it helped communities to recognize or re-recognize the complementarity between pastoralists and agriculturalists uh, so that there was more of a welcoming of this rather than a tension over these pastoral tenure issues. And I think that was a, uh, an encouraging aspect of this. Thanks, that's really, that's really interesting. Um, I wanted to come back, um, I, Hippolyte, do we, do we have you um, with technological difficulties sorted? Um, yes. Is, Oh, perfect. So I had asked kind of what makes this uh, World Food Program's uh, food assistance for assets activities different from uh, similar interventions by other agencies in contributing to social cohesion. Um, please, um, over to you. Yes, thank you again for the chance. And as I said, unlike um, other organizations that probably just jumped out of a land cruiser and decided what was going on was important for the community, the World Food Program had a process that focused on identifying real community needs, needs that were identified by community members themselves, you know, and then they created space for them to dialogue over these things. The CBPP process was one that dismantled boundaries, brought people of different age groups, different people of different socioeconomic backgrounds together to decide what is it that they're going to do. And in that process, it broke the, broke the barriers for different people. And the interventions themselves, then delivered concrete um, uh, results that met the direct needs of the people. Water, for, uh, fodder for their animals, uh, improved soil fertility, dry season gardening. These were concrete things that were able to be delivered, which met the collective needs of the people. And so they found that working together was able to, br to bring them results more than uh, if they did it separately. Then there was a demonstrable social cohesion benefit they realized the interdependencies that existed between them. You know, they saw the symbiotic relationships. For instance, the herders saw that they were able to gain from the, the crop residues of farmers. And the farmers were gaining from the, the animal dung that was left in the communities because the herders didn't have to travel very far with their, with their, with their cattle. So they had a, an increased amount of manure in the community that they, they could use. That symbiotic relationship uh, it began to emerge across different uh, uh, areas. And then, of course, it helped them to erase uh, all the tensions that they had, because when their people met and worked together and benefited together, they saw the value in working together and they saw the need to keep working together. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that, that, that makes sense. And appreciate you finishing off your, your remarks there. Um, I hope I, I, can, I can raise a question now. Uh, to Thomas Conan. Um, I'm wondering um, uh, how can the findings be used to reinforce resilience program more broadly uh, by the World Food Program, but also potentially by other partners as well? We can see you now, Thomas. Thank you. Sorry, apologies. I received a, I was chasing away another call. Um, just to say, uh, these findings not only uh, enable us to uh, uh, change the, the, the way we are uh, impacting our programming. We, we are, as I mentioned, we were when we started the uh, the study, we were a few years into our first phase of the of the scale up of the resilience investment in the investment programming to for the resilience of communities. And we are right now, as uh, Dr. Ones was presenting before, uh, defining the next step for the next five years. So we know better, thanks to this study and, and a couple of others, what, uh, how do we need to reinforce some of the, 
the direct or indirect impact uh, that we can have when working with communities, how important it is and how possible it is to actually uh, look at our gender sensitive and transformative intervention, how it is possible to ensure that the different components of the communities are fully involved in the design, in the monitoring, in the evaluation of our programming. We, we have a number of, of, of learning uh, that, that we can use, that we will be using for this second phase, and that we hope can also be uh, beneficial uh, for the other agencies. But what, what matters particularly for us to, is to say that it has a real impact on the way we do business. It has a real impact if we give the voice, if we provide agencies to all the, the, the communities that we aim to, to, uh, to, to support. It has a real impact if you involve them in the monitoring, in the evaluation, uh, in the design, in the targeting. That's what this study particularly uh, demonstrates and much more. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks for those remarks. Um, online we've got questions that are coming in and i hope that people will continue to add questions to the chat here um, but I'd, I'd like to start out um, with a few questions here and um, uh, one of the first questions here was it says it appears the data um, this is a question for hippolyte um, it says it appears the data were from during and at the end of the program were there baseline data to see the comparison before the program? And I'll pause to quickly say this is a, a challenging situation working in fragile and conflict affected settings myself. I know that often you don't get a, a clean baseline, uh, but decisions have to be made. And um, and making those decisions based on the information we have is, is what's important. So I wonder, um, uh, you know, Dr. Poole, if you could kind of walk us through a little bit of um, uh, what the study setup was there and um and and what your thoughts are on sort of um you know what we do in, in these types of settings and and perhaps um you know how the study was structured the way it was over to you thanks so much thank you for the question a great question as was said from the right uh, for the beginning there was no baseline because there was no intention to do social cohesion programming in the design of the WFS interventions. So as a result, there was a baseline. Even if the WFP had done any baseline on the work that they were doing in the food for uh, uh, FAB activities, they didn't collect baseline data on social cohesion building. So that's why the design of the interventions took a largely qualitative approach, you know, to try to learn from the, the, the views and experiences of people, the lived experiences of the people who are involved. What is their experience? How does social cohesion look like? How do they define it? What is, was it important for them? So that's why you find out that throughout the, the research, we use the voices of the people in how they define social cohesion, how they saw it happening, and how they related to it. So uh, in a nutshell, there was no baseline. We are hoping and as Ruth mentioned at the beginning, this was intended as a pilot study. We're hoping that we now have some data that can serve as a baseline for an extended study uh, to cover more areas, to cover more countries, or for a, another phase, as uh, Thomas said, if they go through the development of a pro project that includes social cohesion building as an intentional activity, then at the end, we will see uh, from where we are at today and where we will be in five years' time, what change has happened and why has that change happened? So there was no baseline. This data is a seminal one that we hope to use for future studies. Thank you. Great. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense, and um, I appreciate those responses. Um, I've got a question for uh, Juanis um, now. Um, one of the study findings was that women participating in resilience programs expressed a sense of empowerment. What mechanisms did the study reveal that led to this outcome? Oh, you're muted, Wannis. I was saying that, as it has been said earlier, it's the methodology uh, that led to our intervention. Pr uh, prior to undertaking any action, we do what is known as uh, participatory planning. 
you know, after our integrated context analysis, we do participatory planning. And in that participatory planning, women participate, uh, young uh, folks participate, old and young. So uh, they have their voice into that. So imagine a woman who has never attended a big meeting where men are as well, you know, because of the cultural barrier, but all of a sudden is there, she's there, she's voicing some of the concerns, she's shaping the interventions that may happen. That's really gives a voice to those women and strengthen uh, their, um, their ability to advocate for their needs and have a sense of, oh, okay, I'm actually important, I can, you know, propose an idea that will be undertaken. So it's very, very important to involve them. It may sound like an order theory of development, but this study, which is very recent, shows that it's still very, very important to run participatory planning exercise. Back to you. Thank you so much, Juanes. Uh, that is um, definitely um, important to think about those pathways. There's another audience comment um, that I think I'd love to direct to Ruth um, uh, Mines and Dick um that's related to the gender issue as well um we know that improving gender equality is key for resilience uh, but promoting land ownership for women and i imagine as well promoting other um empowerment can increase backlash and that could actually reduce social cohesion so so how do you find the balance in this over to you ruth so for one of the main one of the starting points on this is that we're not always talking about land ownership in a Western sense, but security of tenure, security of those rights and responsibilities. So that's taking off the table the idea that uh, we're giving individualized uh, titles to women or something like that can sometimes help as a starting point. Um, some of the the way those rights get implemented in practice is through these participatory planning processes. So when a land is given to a group of women for a community garden that is seen as contributing to nutrition uh, for their families, then that provides a stepping point where you know, others in the community see, oh yes, women having secure rights to this is good for everybody. So these step-by-step -step processes of realizing that land tenure is involved in a lot of the planning processes for natural resource management and for how the land is used, bringing bringing women into those processes creates that opportunity and showing that there can be gains for for the community or for the households in general is often a way of doing that rather than saying in alleviating the fears that uh secure land rights for women means necessarily separating off and carving up that communal land. I think that's one of the, the, the stepping stones toward this. Great, thank you for that. It, it seems like there, there's hope that there is um, balance here. Um, there's a, a possibly small question um, asked by Andrea Bonn. Um, bringing people together seems to have been instrumental for fostering social inclusion. What percentage of total program costs went toward meeting facilitation? I wonder if someone wants to jump in and answer that question. Or maybe in general, talk about how the allocation of budget across activities um, was done. Yeah, great, I make. I mean, please, please, one us come on in and feel free to turn your camera on. I was suggesting that Greta can come in and give us some specifics. Oh, great, Greta, please. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, we don't have a particular budget for, like, for like uh, facilitating these meetings, but. Um, I think what is important to mention, because a couple of people have mentioned the community-based participatory planning exercise that we do, and that is absolutely crucial. So we really sit down with communities at the beginning of, um, of the planning process. But what this study also showed, it's um, not a one-off 
exercise. So the continuous engagement with communities. So we have um, we have management committees, for example, for the land rehabilitation activities that we do. So this continuous engagement over the years, like bringing different groups, different communities together with their leaders has really proven crucial. Um, sorry, I can't give you an exact budget number, but it is basically mainstream throughout all of our activities. Back to you, Katrina. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Greta. Yes, there's a, these are complex budgets I can only imagine, but it's helpful to get some uh, um, sense of things there. Um, a question for um, Hippolyte, which is how do you think we could improve sustainable livelihoods with resource use cohesion? Um, I think kind of the, the focus here is livelihoods as being central here um, and how does maybe social cohesion kind of contribute to improved livelihoods? Um, over to you. Oh, he, he believe you're um, you're muted. Still muted. Yeah, the mute them. It is. It definitely shows as muted. Um, if you're not able to come in and if one of the other panelists would like to uh, take that question about how um, social cohesion can promote um, stable livelihoods. I would welcome someone else to come in. It looks like you believe maybe getting help. Yeah, I think it's no brainer. Um, social cohesion can support um, improved livelihood, but also improved livelihood can support social cohesion. So they work really, it's a kind of, uh, you know, um, one strengthened the other. And the other strength and the other as well. So it's all about, you know, when you have access to resources, you tend to be not confrontational and you don't see the other person as taking something you have, you should be your own because you also have your own. So it's very important to keep that into perspective that social cohesion reinforces livelihood, the livelihood also reinforces social cohesion, but I see hippo, hippo it, uh, maybe back. Yes, I am back. I'm sorry I keep having all these technical glitches. Yeah, so social cohesion supporting livelihoods. When we are talking about an agrarian setting, where people live off land as a communal base for their resources, you know, how do you create a sense of shared ownership, which is already inherent in the land tenure system that they have? How do you then valorize that? How do you make that become a, a source? So we have seen in this case, for instance, that when the asset, the land assets that are improved are equally shared between farmers and herders, between different communities, then they begin to appreciate that working together to protect that property, which is land and the natural resources, water resources, is important for our mutual benefits. So once they begin to see that interdependencies, they begin to see the shared interest in protecting that communal property, then they will work together. You know, and we have seen the examples of farmers and uh, herders working together to develop pasture lands, you know, working together to make sure that they share the common resource coming from the increased productivity of crops, you know, working together to protect water bodies, whereas in the past, they fought over these resources. But now they see that working together, we can maximize. You know, there's a synergetic effect out of that, that we, we collectively will get more by working together than it will work individually. And that was the key lesson for the WFP activities. People realize that if I, we work together, we can do more and we can all benefit more. And therefore, the, the desire to work together becomes the bonding factor to for social cohesion building. Thank you. That's fantastic. I'm seeing it's not a zero sum game, but they, the, it makes salient the fact that this is uh, uh, creating opportunities for multiple people to benefit. Um, fantastic. So I would like to pivot from our Q&A session um, to the rest of our run of show. Um, and next up, we have a presentation on next steps on social cohesion measurement 
and research perspectives. I'd like to uh, invite Sheikh Sam and Nancy McCarthy um, to turn on their cameras and other speakers may turn off their cameras. Um, they will deliver this presentation and then we will do a short uh, 15 minute presentation here and then we will do a short um, five minute Q&A. So I welcome folks online to please put your questions um, uh, in the chat and we will raise them after this next session. Um, thanks and over to you, um, uh, Sheikh and Nancy. Thank you so much, Catalina. Hi everyone and very happy to be part of this interesting webinar to present the results from this interesting study on social cohesion and resilience. But you will allow me to do it in French to be more comprehensive. Merci beaucoup. Donc, donc, en fait, pour notre part, nous allons un peu présenter donc l'approche de l'approche de suivi et de mesure de la résilience au niveau du, du PAM. Donc, juste rappeler que c'est une approche qui a été adaptée donc à partir donc de l'approche corporate globale du PAM au niveau mondial en ce qui concerne donc le suivi de, de la résilience. Donc, c'est une approche qui est en tout cas taillé et designé selon donc le contexte un peu spécifique et voilà multidimensionnel du, du, du Sahel, donc le contexte dans lequel nous, nous intervenons. Next slide. Voilà, donc comme l'ont si bien expliqué les autres panélistes, donc l'Afrique de l'Ouest, en particulier le, le, le Sahel dans lequel Donc, le programme de résilience est en train d'être mis en œuvre. Donc, est un peu marqué par un contexte euh, multidimensionnel, voilà, de crise politique, économique, climatique, etc. Donc, qui fait aussi, donc, euh, remarquer une nécessité d'avoir une, un, une programmation intégrée, telle que donc le programme de résilience. Donc, de ce fait également, pour un peu pouvoir suivre, en tout cas, les performances de, de, de ce programme, il nous faut également une approche de suivi intégré qui ne prennent pas en compte juste voilà un indicateur ou un autre mais également une approche qui essaie en tout cas d'épouser les différentes composantes de ce contexte et euh, l'une des premières en tout cas pièces de, de, de ce puzzle c'est un peu les analyses de vulnérabilité donc on a parlé du contexte sécuritaire dans le Sahel du contexte socio-économique climatique etc donc cette analyse de vulnérabilité là nous permet de voir en fait la situation que ce soit en termes de sécurité alimentaire, que ce soit en termes d'exposition au choc, donc que ce soit en termes donc de, de, de situation politique donc dans la zone, et nous permet également de disons de nous orienter dans le ciblage donc déjà géographique de là où nous voulons intégrer. Donc on a parlé un peu de tout ce qui est approche participative, donc mais le point de départ c'est d'abord l'identification des zones donc caractérisé par différents types de choses. Donc l'analyse de vulnérabilité est un élément important dans, dans, dans le suivi des de, mesures de la résilience. Comme autre élément également, nous avons ce que nous appelons le outcome monitoring, qui consiste un peu à suivre tout ce qui est effet dans le moyen et le long terme, donc de nos interventions. Et là, nous avons deux exercices principalement qui nous permettent Voilà, d'adresser cette question, c'est d'abord les PDM Post Distribution Monitoring, qui est un peu tout ce qui est enquête de suivi après les distributions, donc pour un peu, euh, voilà, mesurer l'effet de la réponse ou bien de l'assistance alimentaire, donc après l'identification euh, des, des, des zones de crise, qui font partie également, donc dans, dans, dans les zones où le programme de résilience est en train d'être mis en œuvre. Donc l'autre exercice également, c'est les annuels surveys, donc tout ce qui est enquête annuelle, qui nous permettent au-delà des indicateurs de sécurité alimentaire, mais qui nous permettent également de voir spécifiquement les questions d'exposition de, au choc, mais également les questions d'adaptation à ces chocs-là, et surtout les questions de capacité de résilience. Et là, ce qui est important, on le verra peut-être dans la présentation de Nancy, c'est comment est-ce que ces différentes données quantitatives puissent être mises en contribution donc dans tout ce qui est études qualitatives qui, est de, qui sont déjà en cours, etc. Donc, jusque-là, on a, euh, disons, une base de données, disons, qui compile l'ensemble des enquêtes menées depuis 2018 à 2022 et la perspective 
C'est le travail justement avec Esprit pour développer voilà, une matrice de suivi donc de la cohésion sociale, en fait, pour laquelle également des indicateurs spécifiques sur la cohésion sociale sont, sont, sont dans, 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 nos, dans nos exercices de suivi. L'autre élément également qui est beaucoup plus, disons, transversal, c'est la, la recherche qualitative. Donc, au niveau du PAM, la recherche qualitative est un élément fondamental qui vient compléter l'ensemble des exercices de suivi que nous menons, que ce soit le process monitoring, le output, le outcome monitoring. Donc, en fait, on essaie de le compléter par des études qualitatives, dont par exemple l'étude sur euh, la contribution des interventions de résilience sur la cohésion sociale, donc, qui intègre parfaitement cet aspect. Mais également, au niveau du bureau régional, également, on est en train de développer, donc de disséminer cette approche qualitative-là au niveau des bureaux pays, de sorte à les pousser à identifier des thématiques de recherche, donc en lien avec la résilience, en lien avec le genre, en lien avec la cohésion sociale, etc. Donc, c'est en tout cas une composante qui s'applique à chacune des autres composantes. L'autre élément, c'est les études complémentaires. Voilà, que ce soit donc des études basées sur l'image et les satellites, parce qu'en fait, comme Onès l'avait euh, expliqué, la, la, la porte d'entrée, c'est très souvent la réhabilitation des terres et c'est important de disposer d'outils, en tout cas, qui permettent de mesurer et de suivre l'évolution de cet écosystème-là. Et là, on a euh, le AMS, qui est le Asset Impact Monitoring from Space, donc, qui est développé pour un pouvoir, comment est-ce que évoluent les indicateurs liés à, en tout cas à la végétation, liés à voilà, la couverture uh, du hey, sol, etc. Apologies that I come in here. I'm, I'm notified that while we have French interpreters, we do not have anyone that's translating into English. And so our English audience will actually not be able to. Apologies, this does not go two ways. I'm wondering if it's possible for you, yeah. noting our interpreter can do it, if you can do it in um, English. Um, apologies yeah. for, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I didn't I didn't notice that. Oh, sorry. So just let me, okay, take it. So I was saying that we have designed our monitoring system to cope with the, um, how to say, the, the complex context where we are operating when it comes to, to, to resilience intervention. And we're saying that the Sahel region was marked by different type of uh, vulnerabilities like political on conflict, also uh, food security and climate. So from this perspective also, we have tried to develop a monitoring system that intends to address those particular issues. That's why one of the big piece of this monitoring system is the vulnerability assessments, which means that we are looking at the different elements that are, how to say, evolving, but that are also characterizing the, the context you are operating. So in, in this part, we focus on um, food security assessment. We focus on also, how to say, uh, climate, climate um, studies, so we have one, one exercise we call integrated context analysis, which combine different pieces of information on food security climate to help to target geograph geographically where we should operate or where we should prioritize. So another component is about outcome monitoring, which is also a big piece of our puzzle. As we have two rounds, the first one is the, the post decision monitoring which follows the distribution or assistance delivery to vulnerable communities. And this post-distribution monitoring allow WFP to identify the effects, okay, to identify the effect of uh, the assistance. But also we have at the end an, an annual survey, which is more comprehensive and that allow to have uh, an overview of the capacity, the resilience capacities of communities. We have also a qualitative approach, which is transversal. I mean, which is cross-cutting and apply to each other component. And also we intend to develop complementary studies based on satellite imagery uh, to see, okay, how the ecosystem where we operate is evolving in terms of indicators that are related to soil, that are related to vegetation, etc. And lastly, we have also the evaluation kit, which is very important 
because we are working closely with the evaluation unit, but also with external evaluation um, institute uh, to investigate some of impacts or effects of our, our resilience intervention. And maybe Nancy will go more deeply on those particular points. Thank you, and sorry for time. Thank you so much, and over to you, Nancy. I was muted, <laughs> sorry. So in this short presentation, I'm gonna look at adding site level context and pre-testing collection of social cohesion metrics into the research mix. And by site level, I mean the locus of activities for food for assets, which is sometimes one community, but sometimes two or three or more communities. Next. So <clears throat> the first question is why do we believe that we need this type of information? And we argue very strongly that this additional information helps to situate individuals' voices in the local institutional context. And this local institutional context will shape every step in the causal chain from outputs to outcomes to impacts. So if we start with the box on the left-hand side, these are a few examples of the types of information we would like to collect. And that's sort of an accounting with land and water resources, rights to those resources, local governance institutions, public infrastructure, community groups, markets, and importantly, as she was just saying, exposure to weather shocks and also to violent conflicts. And so the graph portrays how this context is actually gonna have effects that ripple across all the steps. So it'll help shape how the FFA, FFA activities interacting with social cohesion as well generate the project outputs, and probably even more importantly, how those outputs are effectively translated into the outcomes of improved natural resource base and greater agricultural productivity. And then again, how these outcomes translate into the impact of greater resilience to shocks and stressors. So basically, this slide is simply showing that context matters, and it matters for each step in this in the causal chain. Next. So how would we go about doing this? And the first mechanism we would like to um, use would be a concise and semi-structured questionnaire for the food for assets implementers. So this would collect basic project activities and details that are often already collected as part of the standard ME, but also the community and site level characteristics mentioned in the previous slide. And also, we would like to match this data with two different types of data that comes from secondary sources. One is, of course, an assessment of the climate risks that she was just talking about. These can include the GIS-based indicators of different types of risks that people face. There are droughts, there's erratic rainfall, there's late onset, there's floods, there's high temperature spikes. So there's actually a myriad of uh, types of climatic risks that we need to get a better understanding of at the site level. And then also a risk of violent conflicts through data provided, for instance, by the armed conflict and event data, data set. Next. And then the final uh, area for future research would be to pilot test site level indicators related to social cohesion. This could potentially be very important because picking up data on from individual respondents tends to be geographically targeted and it's quite expensive. So if we can find site level indicators, then it may be the case we can pick up that information over a much broader geographic scale and more frequently. So drawing from the literature on social cohesion, as Ruth said, there's, there's a lot of different ways to try and define and get at social cohesion. And it looks like it, it should be done within the context that you're dealing with. And so specific indicators are never gonna be universally applied, but we've picked out a few that seem to apply in this particular context. So we wanna get an, an understanding of the number and percent of food for asset beneficiaries and other community members participating in those facilitated dialogues that Greta discussed. The number of cross-religious, cross-ethnic, 
across community events, the incidence of disputes and conflicts, both over FFA activities and other areas of conflict, some metrics of collaborative conflict management, the density of market, social, and governance networks. We'd also like to gather information on the documented responses to external shops at the community or the site level. Um, and these can include, of course, weather shocks and violence. And then participation by community members in collective action outside of the FFA activities. So many in many communities, they have committees and to repair board poles, schools, roads, et cetera. So that type of collective action outside of um, the Food for Assets program. Next. So this is just a summary because I'm proposing certain types of future research needs, but I've just summarized what um, all three of us, uh, Ruth, Hippolyte, and myself, have now um, proposed for future research. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. McCarthy. Um, fantastic remarks, and it's great to have that perspective of looking forward. Um, I'd like to do a brief question for each of you and, and, and Chick. Um, first, if I could start with Chick Sam, um, I'm wondering what mechanisms do you think can be set in place to reinforce uh, social cohesion measurement? Thank you so much, Katarina. I think, like I was, uh, mentioning during my presentation, or there is a way forward to explore with um, FP how to define a matrix on measuring social cohesion by combining um, quantitative data. Uh, yet, I would say Nancy was talking about seat level indicator, but also at house or level indicator, we can focus on. Um, some subjective indicator, okay, trying to see um, the level of interaction and the level of relationship that um, uh, particular individuals are feeling within their communities, but also are feeling uh, towards the, the external communities. And in our syst existing system, we have those kind of indicators, which is related to social capital and to see, okay, how those Mm, indicators are evolving um, within the household or participant in resilience activities. I think this one be part of the entry points to see how we can really enforce social cohesion measurement by combining household level, I would say, indicator, but also site level indicator. Thank you. Great, thank you for those remarks. Um, and Nancy, I'm sort of curious for you, what's the frontier? Is there any particular locations or settings in which you think would be super promising and ripe for, for future work? And um, uh, just kind of what, what would be um, your, the place where you would really like to push this forward? I think that, um, as I said, all across the Sahel, because there's a lot of context differ so Burkina from Niger, but then also Burkina, Niger, Mali, and the, and the remaining Sahel countries would be interesting to study that more, and I haven't, so you've caught me off guard, to actually strategically pick additional locations be, precisely because they do have different underlying characteristics that we might think are very important that we don't know as much about. Um, but yep, I, I haven't thought about that the, enough. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Nancy. Well, I'm sure many interesting work will be done by the folks here. Um, and I, I just wanted to say um, thanks. I have a lot of really interesting takeaways today from this work. Um, it seems like we know when we're working in fragile and conflict affected settings uh, that we have a great deal of challenges on our hands. And those challenges are due to the complexity of the um, fragility itself, the, the livelihood challenges met, the security challenges, climate change um, as a threat point, um, but they're also due to data limitations um, in those settings and, and the need to come up with answers that are possibly more urgent in these settings than in any other setting. Um, and I think that this group um, and this team has done a tremendous job at unearthing how is programming that is going to be implemented, um, how can it affect 
something we know that is critical to avoid future fragility, future conflict, uh, which is building this social cohesion, reducing tensions that end up um, creating a spiraling um, um, set of, of, of fragility concerns. Um, and so I've, I've really enjoyed various insights here about what works, what are some of the, um, in, in some cases, surprising ways where bringing people together has resulted in people um, forming linkages across ethnic groups um, and, and across communities to try to um, have, a, have this, um, this sense of cohesion that is so important to livelihoods, um, so important to empowering and valuing women, um, and so important to reducing um, uh, threats to threats of conflict and fragility. So um, thank you very much. I, I hope we can um, appreciate our participants here, um, the World Food Program and this tremendous and important partnership with uh, IFPRI um, and hopefully um, many more, much more work done with the World Food Program and our uh, CGIR research initiative on fragility, conflict and migration. Um, thank you again to those who have joined. We appreciate it. I can invite everyone to come on camera again here. We've um, appreciated and enjoyed having you today and 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 take care and we'll see you at the next if pre policy seminar